What is up, Whiskey Ginger fans? I want to let you know what's going on in my life. Ladies and gentlemen, this weekend, I'm going to be in Nashville, Tennessee. Going to be in Nashville, then in Huntsville, Alabama. Then the following weekend, I'm going to be at Cobbs in San Francisco. The following weekend, I'm going to be in Indianapolis. Then I go home, take some turkey, put it in my mouth, take a nap, ski doodles. Then I'm back in California doing the Bray Improv, the 6th and the 7th, and I'm doing... Uh, one last show of the year um, in uh, December 14th at the Ice House. Two shows, actually, one night. Um, and then kicks off the Red Rocket Tour of 2020. As you can see here, the amazing uh, art made by Jenna Sunday and Joseph Faria. Um, come see the Red Rocket Live. Go to andrewsantino.com for tickets. Um, I am so excited. We're adding new dates as we go. Um, we're going to keep it moving, baby. Please come out and support the Red Rocket. This episode of Whiskey Ginger is brought to you by Buffalo Trace. Buff Trace, as you know, is the only bourbon with balls. My friend, I am a big push uh, of this. I'm your push uh, um, in this uh, beautiful uh, chalice is, uh, as always, some Eagle Rare that I like to fill up and change, but it's always a buff product that's going to be sitting on our desk because I'm a big fan of it, man. Um, I think it's incredible. Since 1773, they've been making the good sauce. They even operated uh, under prohibition when they shouldn't. Naughty, naughty. Um, the facility is incredible. If you get a chance down in Franklin County to take a tour, it is something to see, my friends. Um, Buffalo Trace makes a myriad of great products, but they're OG stuff. This is the good jazz, dude. It's 45%. That's 90 proof. And it's uh, made there. It's uh, aged there. It's bottled there. Everything is done on site in Kentucky. And I got to tell you, man, it's my favorite stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's a perfect price point of delicious sipping bourbon. And I push it all the time because I really do believe in it. And it's really good sauce. And we like good sauce here on the Whiskey Ginger Podcast. So go and grab yourself some Buffalo Trace um, because they're changing the ways that whiskey is being made. And I'm proud to support them because they're proud to support me. So go on and get you a bottle of Buff Trace that bourbon with balls. You can see it right on the label. Go ahead and take a picture. Send it to your family. You can see he's got his nuts hanging down because he don't care, baby. It's Kentucky bourbon. It's the best there is, my friend. So drink up some Buffalo Trace and enjoy the episode. In here, we pour whiskey, 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 whiskey. Oh, that creature in the ginger beard. Sturdy and ginger. Like vampires, the ginger gene is a curse. Gingers are beautiful. Five dollars for the whiskey and seventy-five dollars for the horse. Gingers are hell no. This whiskey is excellent. Ginger. I like gingers. Predictable. Predictable. Heavy on the dick. Heavy, heavy on the dick. Predictable. Um, let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Whiskey Ginger. My guest today is one of my favorite people on earth. I say that for all my guests, but I mean it especially today. It is Nick Swartzen. Nick! Hi! Are you happy? I'm very happy. You look good. Thank you. Do you feel good? I feel great. Yeah? Yes. How long have you been off the sauce? Um, I haven't drank since September 25th. Oh, you didn't want to do it on 9-11? You no. You stopped I on 9-11. Everything. I know. I know. Damn it. Did you do anything on 9-11? Did you celebrate? I didn't. I um. You don't celebrate the holiday? I don't. I, I was going to go to Vegas and go to New York, New York. But I didn't. I, I, I didn't have the money. Yeah. You didn't have enough money? <laughs> no. So September 25th is when you quit. You have to eat this a little bit, by the way. Eat this a little bit more. Pull oh, really? It. Yeah, there okay. you go. Not that much. That's insane. Okay. That's good. All right. Um, What? You quit on the 25th? You quit? I quit on the 25th. Wasn't um by choice. So I, uh, I, I usually do this. Um, I usually detox like half the year. So I'll go drive for like five months. And I take a ton of vitamins. I eat really healthy. A lot of people don't know this. They just think I'm like a tornado all the time. But I eat like really healthy. I do like acupuncture, all this stuff. And then I'll do the opposite. <laughs> so then I'll go <laughs> on a fucking shit storm and I'll just drink for like four months straight. Well, did you pick the five months that you would take off? Like, on, like was it like, I'm going to take off... You know, January, fucking... Kind of. Well, I had gone into a movie in February with... It was me and Spade. And uh, so I don't drink when I film. Yeah. So I did, like, you know, we filmed for, like, two months. And then I just carried it over after that. And I was developing a new TV show and pitching that. So I was dry for another three months. And yeah. then 
Memorial Day weekend hit, and I was like, let's dance. Goodbye. Yeah, so I just <laughs> signed up all summer and just went. And I just drink. I don't do drugs. People think, like, because I make fun of cocaine and stuff, I do that shit. But I just drink. But I drink a lot. Like, I'm from Minnesota, where it's fucking insane how much they drink. Everybody drinks. I'm from Chicago. It's, it's Yeah, it's, it's fucking psycho. Yeah. I mean, like... It, it, their tolerance is just insane. It's like when I go home, it's so much. I remember uh, one time speaking of Chicago, which is one of my favorite cities. I remember I landed and I went, checked into my hotel and then I just went out to get a bite and get a cocktail. It was like four in the afternoon. It was like a happy hour. Mm -hmm. And there are these guys. There's like eight dudes that are obliterated. This is Wednesday, happy hour. They're obliterated, middle of the day. And they're like, hey, what's it? Yeah. And they're like, shots? I'm like, no, I'm good, man. It's, it's still four. I'm like, you know, I'm just having a cocktail. And I go, hey, your buddy, I think, is really fucked up, man. You might want to watch him. And they're like, dude, that's Jerry, man. He's, he's like that all the time. He's fine. <laughs> I'm like, I think Jerry's in bad shape. Like, I know bad shape. I think Jerry might be, might, might want to tap out. And they're like, dude, no. Uh, Jerry gets up, stands on a table, stands on a table, it just wobbles. He just goes face first at another table, smashes his entire face, fucking out. Fuck. And I was like, Jerry. <laughs> and they're like, whoa. And I'm like, get him a fucking cab or an Uber. Like, what are you doing? They're like, immediately got him out of there. And I was but that's, just like, that's Chicago. Oh, yeah. There they was just do, like, they, I, we grew up like, that's why I'm always, uh, I've talked to Rogan about this. He's always like, do you think, because I made fun of them for Sober October. I think it's funny that they all like, quit their vices and then they just go full bore again right when it's over it's like yeah. that's not really doing much if you want to temper it i guess that makes sense but to be like one month we're gonna chill and then come november i'm gonna die like they all i mean Bert. Yeah. did you see how much weight Bert lost no kreischer lost a ton of weight like in one month i was blown away he, he went through with it sober october yeah man he's he is like it's it's i think I think Joe said 50 pounds, 50 pounds, if I'm not wrong. I mean, I believe that. Well, did you lose weight when you stopped? I lost weight. So I. You look, you look sh in shape, shape. Yeah. Are I you like working got, out a bunch too. I'm like getting back into like working out and just, uh, I mean, I, so I drank so much over the summer that I have ended up in the hospital yeah. for three weeks. So it was like bad. I had posted on my Instagram. Yeah. And, uh, but it, it was like, I, I, I downplayed it big time. What happened? Um, so I go on this bender. I end it in Minnesota. I do a show and then I drink for like a month and a half Minnesota. I'm going to twins games, Vikings games and just hanging out with my buddies and we're just getting smashed. And then, uh, I borrow from my hotel room, not weird. And, uh, my buddy picks me up, take me to the airport. Cause I've got shows in Colorado and I turn to my buddy and I go, I go, something's wrong, man. And he's like, ah, oh, you're just hungover. And I'm like, no, I know hangovers. Like, this is, something's wrong. And he's like, just get on the plane. You're fine. So I throw up in the airport getting my ticket. <laughs> so I'm at the computer and I'm like, mm, all right, barf. <laughs> Again, not ab abnormal. But now I've got pains in my body. So I'm like, something's wrong. I'm kind of panicking. So I get on the plane. I throw up on the plane Yeah. in the bathroom. And then I get back to my seat. And uh, we're landing in Denver. And I just open my carry-on and barf on all my clothes. <laughs> and the guy next to me is like, okay. <laughs> so then I get off the plane, go get like some Tums and like a Gatorade. And that didn't help. No. So I'm like, all right, I'll get a cocktail. So I get Smart. a cocktail. That didn't help. Then I throw up again. And now I'm in like pain, like all over my body being stabbed. So I go to urgent care and they're like, oh my God, you need a fucking ambulance. So they call an ambulance, and I go to University of Colorado Hospital, and they check me in, and it was fucking Armageddon. It was three weeks of just, like, the worst, the worst thing you could go through. It was awful. I mean, there's worse things, you know what I mean? I talked to a lot of my friends who've gone through, like, you know, cancer and stuff. But this was just so intense for such a brief period of time, and it was altitude sickness, alcohol poisoning, pneumonia, pancreatitis, um, sepsis in my blood, Whoa. which can all, each one of those things can take you out. And I had all four. Sepsis in your fucking blood? Yeah, it was fucking horrifying. So I was hooked up to tubes, feeding tubes. I mean, it, it was it, it was insane, dude. Wow. And uh, it was really bad. Surgery? No, but I had procedures. So they had to drain the toxins out of my lungs, drain my stomach. Jesus. Yeah, and I was out for all of it, obviously. And they just... 
It was hardcore, dude. And so it, there's a wake up call. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of, <laughs> and it's funny because I'd had so many wake up calls, like so many, where it was like, oh, I should probably, but no. So this one, so I, people don't know this. I had a 10% chance of living. What? 10% chance. Because you had so many combined problems. I had so many things at once that were all lethal. And it was, it was like, it was gnarly. And they told my family, they're like, be prepared to say goodbye to Nick. Holy shit. So my family all flew in and I underwent all these things. And the doctor's like, it's a miracle if he walks away from this. It's a miracle. Jesus. Like there were so many things that could have gone wrong. And I, uh, I walked away from it, which is God insane. God. And they were like, you should probably not drink again. And I was like, yeah, it's fine. Like, I don't mind. I, I never needed to drink. You just loved I just it. loved it. Like yeah. I had a blast. Like people who've met me on the road, I go to bars after the show. I buy shots. I mean, I like, you know, I, I just love drinking yeah. and like, you know, I'm just having a blast. I've always had a blast. I'm not like a fighter. I'm not d dramatic. I'm not gonna, you know what I mean? So you do steal stuff though. You you do you get black. I steal, steal helicopters. <laughs> that was one <laughs> that was thing one that was time. a real dice roll. <laughs> <laughs> LAPD, catch me now. <laughs> I think they say 10%. I truly believe this. I think they give percentages um, to give you like the fighting hope. You know what I mean? Like when they're like, right. he's only got 10%. It's so you're like, I'm going to make it. I think they do that uh, to like okay. give you this like influential. You know, because they say like people that, this is, this is totally true though. People that want to live, tend to live, you know, through weird right. adversity. Like even medical issues like, they say when people just kind of stop or give up, they die. They literally are just like, man, fuck it. Because the body kind of loses any sort of adrenaline or movement to try to like keep you pumping and going. I think they do that to give you some sort of inspiration to be like, hey, man, this could, this literally could be it. I mean, for the obvious reason of you being very sick. Right. But I think they do that to fucking get in your head. And well, they like, didn't tell me that. They didn't I was say told me? after. Oh, shit. So I went Never through mind. All they were like, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I went through all this shit, and then afterwards... I started to get better and better. And then uh, my sister was like, yeah, you had like a 10% chance of living. And I was oh like, God. what? She was like, yeah, we were told to take a bye to you. And I was like, nobody told me that. And they were like, my sister goes, yeah, you were like in a weird headspace where you kept saying who brought all these rabbits <laughs> because you were like hallucinating. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I probably wouldn't have absorbed any information if I was... Trying to find They probably rabbits. had you juiced up on shit, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was you like, were probably gone. It took a while for me. I mean, I'm still like kind of, I mean, I'm like 98%, but I was just on so much shit and like coming down from that. I didn't realize I was like, oh yeah, I'm back. And it's like, no, your body, everything has to like to readjust. readjust. Yeah. my grand, When my grandfather had was riddled with cancer and he was like on his way out. Uh, there was a couple of great stories. I mean, this is, it's like, it's funny, but it's not, but he was so fucking like loopy and out of it with like all the shit they were giving him. Yeah. That like my dad walked in and he was like, "Hey Jim, do you want to like go for a walk around the you know around around the room?" Because he didn't. They kept telling him it was a hospital, but I think he just like didn't admit that it was a hospital. They would say it, and he'd be like, "This isn't a goddamn fucking. I don't go to hospitals." It's like, right. Yeah. Okay. Let's walk around this facility. And he would walk, and he'd go. <laughs> he like my dad like walked out. He's like, "Are you gonna are you gonna come with?" I thought you just said you wanted to go. And my grandfather sat up. He's like. As soon as you get these fucking snakes out of my room, I'll get out of the bed. <laughs> and I was yep. like, I was like, Dad, such an easy snakes on a plane joke, like right there for you. Like, why didn't you just lay it in? Teed it up. But he just, but he was so like off on drugs. He used to ask my dad for money. He'd be like, Hey, pal. He didn't know who my dad was at some point. He's like, Hey, pal. He's like, Would you give me a, give me a twenty spot? My dad's like, what? And he's like, give me a 20 spot. I have no fucking pockets. Yeah, he's in like a hospital gown. Right. And he's like, they took my fucking money. They took everything from me. My dad's like, I don't think you need money around here. He's like, you always <laughs> need money, idiot. My dad's like, all right. So he would just hand him 20 bucks all the time because my grandfather thought like, you need cash. Something's right. going to happen. You need cash. But it's just because like he was so amped on shit. That he just was, I mean, it was like a, he was like in a lucid dream world the whole fucking time. Yeah, it's really surreal. And I fucking did the same thing. I was in my gown, hooked up to all these tubes. And uh, I kept going, where's my fucking wallet? <laughs> and my sister's like, it's in your bag. And I'm like, can I have it? <laughs> and she'd be like, why? Why do you need your wallet? I'm like, and she's, this is all stuff that's told to me. And I go, every man needs his wallet. <laughs> and she was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah, like, but you're I sticking was, to your principles. That's yeah, like, I was like, like out of the 1920s, like... <laughs> 
broad. Like, yeah, I'm wearing get a tie my wallet, and, broad. Where's my briefcase? <laughs> and but I kept doing shit. I was just told all this. So what, you this remember is, none of this. I remember nothing. Shit. And uh, I remember <laughs> they told me that I go. Um, I would wake up in the middle of the night, three in the morning, and I'm like, take my like fucking robot with IVs, <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I'll see you guys later. And people be like, mm. looks like my sister and my brother would sleep in the room with me. They'd be like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going bowling. And they're like, <laughs> where? What are you talking? You're going bowling? I'm like, they have an alley in the basement. And they're like, no, they, they don't. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm pretty sure they do. I go, I'll be right back. And I would go out and fucking just walk around the halls and like, <laughs> I would like talk to the nurses. I'd be like, let's escape. And they're like, what? Like, it was just like weird. <laughs> But, you know, I just bounced back, but it, it was it was crazy. So long story short, I was just like, you know, I never needed to drink. And so I was just like, you know, I'm 43 now. Yeah. I've done everything. Like, I'm in the Vodka Hall of Fame, like, by, like, first ballot. Yeah, you like, are. Like, there's no question. Yeah, you're up like, there. Like, rafters. Yeah, they raised Jersey. your number. They retired you. Yeah. But now, I, you've, now you feel like you, you're, like, you didn't need it, so now it's like, it's so beyond behind you. you it's not even a thought. Because you didn't, you didn't feel like you had a... An addiction? You feel like it was just you love to party more than to drink. I just love to drink and just have fun and go and get smashed. And I mean, I would laugh. I'd, I mean, I've got a billion stories. I've done everything with drinking. Yeah. Of like just, and I would post it on Instagram, just smashed. I mean, you know, I think back to all the times of just, you know, I, and I loved it, dude. I mean, I, like I said, I was never inappropriate, I was never violent. I would just get fucking house, and my friends, we'd all get fucked up, and just the next day, I'd be like, dude, you remember? You, remember and, you know, you I just did? thought it was funny. Like, did you, I'm interested to know, like, for scale, like, remember, uh, remember when that sheet came out about the, like, the daily diet, so to speak, of, like, cocktail of drugs and alcohol that Hunter S. Thompson did? Do you remember that newspaper clipping? No. Do you never saw that? No, oh God, I'd love dude. to see it. It was like, uh... It's like qua quaaludes in the morning, cocaine, cigarettes, a bottle of Chivas. That he wouldn't even eat till like five p.m. He would like wake up and eat and, and just like eat drugs and drink until like four or five p.m. <laughs> and then and then he would and then he would start a writing session at like two or three in the morning. That's when he would begin after like a full day of like an eight right. bottle of coke and two bottles of Chivas and like. It's an insane list, but it was a newspaper clipping that I think someone did a an article about it. We'll we'll fucking we'll post it for people to see. It's insane, but. Like you, when you're in the he the heaviest part of your drinking, like what is your what's the daily routine of drinking for scale? Just so I like know, because some people are like I drink a lot and they're like I just binge and then I'm done for like until tomorrow evening and then I binge again. I feel like that's what most people in the Midwest do. They right. Binge all Friday, binge all Saturday, Sunday they do like you know Sunday fun day and then Monday through Thursday they're like they they just don't drink at all. Yeah. Well, I mean, like you know, with this job, like being a comedian, it's like you know, you just have so much time and like, I would just take periods off. So I would shoot a movie or something and then do like a small tour. And then I'm like, I'm going to take months off. So this summer I had like scattered dates, but it was for the most part, it was just, I just had time. Yeah. So it was, I mean, if I was getting after it, I mean, I would wake up at 5 a.m. I'd go to my local diner. 5 a.m.? They would start serving at 6 a.m., I would have cocktails until my local bar opened at 11 a.m. Then I would start. I would drink, keep drinking until 3 p.m. Then I would go and take a nap. Then I would wake up at 7 p.m. and then drink until last call. Fuck. Yeah. And I would, you know, and I wasn't like, when I'm in L.A., it's not like crazy drinking. But, uh, you know, I would get pretty hammered. And then, uh, you know, but when I'm in Minnesota, it was like, if I'm on one, I would need three drinks or four drinks just to like kind of get even just to balance out yeah just to go like okay and then i would you know eat and uh you know have like some water and then you know i would just bar hop and you know it, how many total drinks do you think a day was like an average if i was on one yeah i mean 15 to 20 holy fucking and you're not a big guy dude no That's i remember insane i've out drank and I, I mean, I'm proud of this. I shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should. My old security guard on one of my tours was a black belt. He was six nine, and he was from Chicago, and he was probably 350, 400 pounds. And you and I outdrank him. That guy? Holy and he was so mad. Fuck. And he goes, "How the fuck?" And then my other stupid drinking thing was I outdrank an Irish wedding. 
So my best friend from third grade. That's almost like a sin. It was insanity because I'm Swedish. <laughs> so my best friend in third grade, I was his best man. And uh, I show up at the church <coughs> and I was like going to pace myself, you know, because mm-hmm. I have to give a speech and you have the whole thing. So 9 a.m. I'm at the church. His mom goes, Nicholas. All right, let's go. And I'm like, what? What's going on? Are we rehearsing? And she goes, no. And she hands me a bottle of Jameson. 9 a.m. I haven't eaten yet. I'm like, are you kidding me? And she goes, Nicholas, you're the best man for Robert. And I'm like, all right. So I start drinking Jameson. We drink throughout the entire day. And we're just drinking. Like, everybody has a bottle of Jameson. This Pre-wedding, is like yeah. St. Paul, Minnesota, Irish, like, <laughs> serious. <laughs> So we drink and we drink and we drink and I have to start eating and like just trying to pace myself and I do the speech and I roast everybody I've known them my whole life. And then we just keep drinking and there's after party and like all this stuff. So I went from 9 a.m. to 4 a.m. with his dad, his two uncles, hardcore Irish. And uh, we're in the hotel room. We're still drinking. And they all just go, I got to go to bed. And I just go, so I won. (laughs) I won. I won, right? I'm the last man standing. And they were like, Yes, yes, you won. And I'm like, yes, I was so happy. I beat an Irish fucking wedding. I know, I fucking won an Irish wedding. <laughs> I mean, those I, are the days. Those are the good days. Those were in the past. I mean, we've all had those fucked up, insane drinking stories, but I think when they linger through your 30s, it gets harder and harder to justify them. When you're 25, when you tell one of those funny stories, people are like, yeah, that's great, it's funny. And then you get older, and even you get scared of them. You're like... I can't believe we fucking did that. That, like, wasn't a good idea. Like, when I was 22 or 3, my buddy was at college at Marquette, and we were partying at Marquette with the Irish rugby team, and they were fucking, like, just insane human beings. Like, just always wanted to fight and drink and fight and drink. And this girl, we were at her apartment, and I I remember I was, I mean, I barely remember, but I was so fucking out of it that, like, I was, I picked her up, and I was hugging her, like, by her, like, legs and her butt, like, you know, like, I was picking her, and she's, like, yelling and laughing in the air, and I'm, like, eh, and I fucking fell, and she hit her head against the coffee table, and Oof. everybody was, like, oh, my God, and she popped back, she, like, bounced up, she's, like, yeah, fine, and we all started laughing and partying, and then someone's, <laughs> like, go to the bathroom, and she goes to the bathroom, her ear was split in half, in, like, this way, yeah, yeah, yeah. From Jesus. here, oh my fucking god! We all had that moment of like, oh my god, are you dead? Like I was, she was like, it, is it off? <laughs> it was like hanging down off her fucking Jesus. head. Jesus, yeah, and like in the moment, you're like, cool, but if it happens now at fucking thirty six, I'm like, nah, yeah, that's that's like the if like the, if I do that now, I'm I'm like done. That, then I'm like, oh, I'm done. That's I gotta fucking quit drinking. Yeah. So when the when those moments happen when you're younger, they're easy to justify, and then you get older and you're like, I don't know, 15, 20 drinks is like. It's too much. Oh, I mean, I, because every time you do like a physical, you know, they'd be like, do you, how much do you drink? Yeah, they'd be like, how many drinks do you have like a week? And I would, <laughs> if I was on one, I'd be like, 15 to 20. I remember the doctor one time goes, you have 15 to 20 drinks a week? And I was like, a, a day? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, right. And I go, yeah. And he was like, holy fuck. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> what? Like, You've just... never heard that before, Doc? Yeah. So, you know, but I mean, I'm looking for, you know, I mean, those memories, I still, you know, even in my 40s, like, I didn't give a fuck, man. I got like zero fucks tattooed on my arm. Yeah, I love that. Arm. I was just like. Were all your tattoos drunk? No. I mean, a, a handful of them were, but I don't regret any of them. I love all of them. You don't regret, not, there's not one where you're like, not one, not even stupid. close. I love them all. They all, they all have a great, I mean, in my opinion, a great story. But yeah, yeah I mean, you know, drinking's a blast. And I'm not going to be one of those people that's like sober and like, oh, you know what? You know, but I just, I do just want to tell people that are drinkers, like just to kind of, especially the older you get, like make sure you just get like blood work and just make sure like your pancreas, your liver, you know what I mean? Because you know, once you go down a road where you can't go back, you're fucked, so, you know? And it's not like people drink like I do, but there are people that drink heavily. When I was in the hospital, I would ask, I was asking nurses, I'm like, oh, do a lot of people come in here for drinking? And she was like, guys come in here with cirrhosis that are like 23. What? Yeah. I mean, like, and your liver is not even all about, you know, it's diet too. I mean, it's luckily, things, yeah. luckily I, I always eat really healthy. Like I gave up dairy years ago. I don't really eat sugar. You know, a lot of people don't know that about me, but it's like, I don't eat fast food. I don't eat, you know, stuff like that. So if you balance it out, it really helps. You oh, know? definitely. Well, the problem is where we come from, that doesn't exist, right? No. I mean, when I quit dairy, 
I would go home to Minnesota, and it was fucking impossible. Like I might as well have say, said, like I don't like air anymore. Yeah, like uh, air is bad. It's gross and it's fattening. When you quit dairy and you go home, they're like, "What do you eat then? You don't have what do you? Have? Yeah, they're just what baffled. You, you eat what do you have? Bread." Well, you have pasta with cheese, right? You're like, no, I can't, fuck, I can't. They well, try to like sneak it in. That's like how my parents are like, they always go like, we don't eat that much red meat. And I'll be like, you just had a burger yesterday. And my mom's like, well, okay, well, okay, yeah. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, if I think you, they just forget what things are because that red meat to them is like just a steak. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like cheese for them is just like slices of cheese. You're like, no, there's cheese in all the shit that you eat. There's milk in all the shit that they eat. <laughs> they just don't think about it or care. I know, and I've got to go home. And so it's like... No dairy and no drinking, so the Minnesota's going to be very confused. But I think people just be glad I'm not not dead, fucking dead. Yeah, they're, they're going to be happy that you're fucking still living. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god. But did, yeah, did what? you have any like iconic drinking stories with? Because uh, you've you, like you've embedded yourself in Minnesota, uh, Minnesota infamy for sports, especially because you're a sports fan. Like with the Vikings and with the Twins. Like, have you drank with athletes? Oh yeah. yeah, I've drank with everybody. I mean, Minnesota's like, I mean, I my last special on Netflix, I wore like a corner bar T shirt, was which is a bar I hang out at in Minneapolis on my special, and uh, I remember Delia was like, "What are you wearing?" And I remember I was wearing basketball shorts. Do you know this story? Yeah, <laughs> I wore, showed my Netflix special <laughs> which with you a can bar see right now. <laughs> a bar T shirt. Yeah, it's on yeah. Comedians of the World. Yeah. A bar T-shirt and basketball shorts <laughs> and shoes with no socks. <laughs> and Delia's like, what are you wearing for your special? And I'm like, this. And he goes, you're fucking kidding me. And I go, no, what? I go, who cares what I wear? And he goes, this is your fucking special. I'm like, I don't, yeah, it's about my jokes. I don't care what, you know. And he's like, <laughs> goes on Twitter. He's like, I'm with fucking Swartzen at our Netflix special taping. He forgot pants. not wearing pants. <laughs> so then I got like all neurotic and I ran out of the taping it was like an hour before taping or whatever and ran in some like french mall in montreal and bought pants and even try them on <laughs> he's just like <laughs> oh my god but the like i wore a, another bar in st paul called plums is one of my home bars i wore that t-shirt on the tonight show or no on jimmy fallon show before the tonight show but on jimmy fallon show i wore a fucking plums t-shirt and everybody's just like what are you like you gotta stay true to your shit though oh yeah i love minnesota it's my favorite but yeah I i've gotten smashed i mean the last the last time i went out uh, the saint paul saints our minor league team won the championship and uh i met up with i became friends with them on twitter and we met up at a bar and they were being honored at the twins game and uh they were like you got to come with us on the field and i'm like hammered when we were all hammered and i'm like what i go what, what do you mean they're like we have a jersey for you and the coach is like who the fuck's this asshole <laughs> and they're like it's nick swartzen dude what are you talking about so i go it's on my instagram you can see the video of them Announcing the team, like, all right, at first bangs, third bangs, I'm up, and then Nick Swartzen, and the crowd's like, what? And then they just keep <laughs> yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. It's great. <laughs> it just pans down to all these like tall, the big baseball players, <laughs> yeah. and then you, and it goes right back up. It was so good. It yeah, was so, so great. It was my last hurrah. But yeah, I mean, I had, yeah, tons of, I so many drinking stories. I mean, it was. But you managed to keep yourself out of like fucked up trouble. You were never like arrested. In, it was never like, oh, did you hear Swartz and went to jail for fucking. No, I was never on TMZ. I never drank and drove. I mean, I did when in my 20s, which is so stupid, but I made a point of like never getting into a car drunk or. That's smart. Do you own a car? Do you even have a car? No, I gave my car up four years ago. Yeah, see, that's what I was like. You fucking, you just get Ubered around, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I live in West Hollywood, yeah. which is where all the three comedy clubs are. So it's like, why? So the improv, the comedy store, Laugh Factory, they're right there. Yeah. And there's a million restaurants and you just walk and, you know. I care about the environment too. I don't need, you know, pollution and shit. I'd just rather take a shit. Yeah. You'd rather take another person's car. Yeah. That makes rather, more sense. Yeah, or helicopter. You pollute, but I'm going to get in inside of it. You pollute. You pollute, not me. But I, uh, yeah, Uber's fucking amazing. So no, it's, I know. Uh, it's it did not, look, not drinking and driving. I'm a big proponent. I think it's hard to not have a fucking car in LA. I'm always impressed by people that don't do it. I heard Jordan Peele didn't have one for the first like five, six years that he lived in LA, that he just didn't have a license in New York and then moved here and was like, yeah, I'm not going to fucking get a car. I don't want to get a car in this city. Well, not having a car, it's, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't have that luxury, but it's like, you know, I don't have to commute. But, uh, you know, it's just it, it's such a stress. Like, I used to live in Venice Beach, which for people who don't know, it's on the beach. But ho Hollywood's <laughs> like, without traffic, it's like 20 minutes 
15, 20, maybe. But with traffic, it can be like 45 to get into Hollywood. It's a fucking nightmare. It's so fucking I remember nightmare. back then, I mean, it was just this the stress of driving. And I mean, I would get road rage like all the time. I remember um, I was really bummed because like the more famous I got, not that I'm that famous, but famous. Mega enough. famous. Yeah. I mean, that's what they ranked you online. Mega, mega famous. famous? Yeah, it's yeah. understandable. I didn't <laughs> want to say it, but, but I remember uh, I would get bad road rage and uh, this car cut me off like really bad, like dangerously. During the day or driving, and I was like, this motherfucker. So I just started fucking tailing the car. I was so pissed. And I pulled up, it was, it was two lanes then, and I pulled up next to it and I rolled down my window. And uh, I go, You fucking piece of fucking shit. And they roll in the window, it's two chicks, and they go, Nick Swartzen, oh my God, we're such fans. And I was like, ha, 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 yeah, drive better. And I just drove away. It's just like totally diffused me. I've had one of those moments of road rage where I was like yelling at a guy and then we, we got up to, this, to the, like the light together and he looked over at me and he was like doing this thing and he was just a huge dude. And I was like, what? What's up? What's up? What's up? No, nothing. I, I wasn't, I wasn't. I pushed out real bad. I was like, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't fucking, no, not me. I wasn't, have a good day. I was so scared he's going to get out, beat the shit out of me. Because in your car, you're like, I'm the toughest guy alive. Oh, yeah. And then when it came down to it, you're like, I don't want to fucking get my ass kicked on La Cienega. Like, mm. I don't want to get fucked up in front of the Beverly Center. Yeah, and you just don't know what's, you know, what anyone's No, you don't know doing. what kind of cycle, what they're fucking, what they're up to. I want to I want to tell you this. This is, this is insane. How old were you when you shot your, your half hour for Comedy Central? You were, the, were you the youngest uh, to ever do a, a half hour for Comedy Central? Is that I true? I was like 22 or 23. And then somebody said Bo Burnham was like 22 or something. I don't for, know. You were the first for a long time. You were the youngest that I had heard of. Yeah. And that was before like the internet. Yeah, so I started in the mid 90s where it was like, we didn't have the internet. <laughs> like we had to, I mean, you know, it was like doing one nighters and bum fuck driving in your car alone across the country for no money i mean just stage time i mean it was like grimy dude. what year was that taping the comedy central half hour i started in 96 the half hour was 99 2000 right here's what's crazy i had i had that half hour on vhs oh really i loved it dude it was I i'm being genuine it was like one of my favorite i remember watching it in college and it was i was i just thought it was the one of the most fun just like seamlessly having a good time while telling jokes, comedian that I'd seen. Because all these comics that I'd seen at the time when I was like getting really deep into comedy, a lot of guys like just formulated sets and they were the joke structure and they were you could tell they were like working so hard on being a comedian. And that was you your first special was kind of like you having the most fun. It looked like you were having more fun than even like the crowd could have and that's why they were like so deep in it with you do you know what i mean it was yeah it was fucking awesome honestly man it was probably one of the best i've ever seen thanks man yeah that special day. was really well received i mean that put me i mean that did everything for me and this uh executive chris young who is still a really close friend um he fought for me to get that he was like nick swartzen is ready for a half hour because i had done premium blend and some other shows and they're like it's too young and chris was like no Trust me, right. he is ready for a half hour. And they're like, he's fucking 20, to whatever I was. And Chris was like, no. He's like, I'm booking him. And he fought for me and booked it for me. And that like, that was one thing that really started to change my life. Because that's when they would air those things like nonstop. Yeah, now they so air them. So all those people never. that started in that era of like me, Gaffigan, Hedberg, Dan Cook, Pablo Francisco. I mean, I'm definitely forgetting a, a lot of people, but... There were so many people that came out of that, th those two first seasons. Do you remember Stephen Lynch? Yeah, of course. Yeah, he was around that time too, Yeah, right? Stephen was around that time. He blew up off that. People that don't know, you should look him the fuck up. I, I, I know he's probably still touring and stuff. I talk about him like he's gone, but like he just is not in kind of the social zeitgeist as much anymore. But back then, he would do uh, he would do songs, and his songs were so fucking amazing. He did stuff with Opie and Anthony for years. Yeah. But he was back then, and I remember he was another guy that I was like, wow, dude, he's having so much fucking fun. It was hard to not get on board of guys that were, like, having a really good time. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, now comedy is can be a little bit more subversive, and a lot of comics now feel like... I feel like they're, like, arduously going through their jokes. You know what I mean? Like, nothing bothers me more when a comic's like, what else? Uh, it's like... <laughs> 
what else? Right. What do you mean, what else? What, why are you t- asking them? Tell them what else. Like, I, I yeah. never, I never like that new transition into what's happening. It's not everybody, but I feel like that was the beginning. Your, you guys' class was the beginning of like people having a fuckload of fun and telling jokes. Do you know what I mean? It was, yeah, totally. It was just this like new energy kind of exploded from all of those young people. Pablo, too. He was fucking good God. I mean, his energy level was unmatched. I know, that's, God. It, was, it was absurd. He's so it's absurd. Funny, though. But I think, um, I just think like that was kind of the, that was the beginning of a new stage and era in comedy. You know what I mean? And it well, did what, kind of push you up over the edge, huh? Yeah. I mean, that changed everything. But the, you know, when I started in 96, comedy was dead. I mean, I remember they were like, comedy clubs were like, why are you starting? It's dead. It's over. Right. Because the 80s had oversaturated. The market's so bad. So to just to put it so you understand, like right now, every major city has like one club. Yeah. Maybe two, they'll have like a B kind of decent room. Sometimes, But they'll yeah. have, you know, an improv or something, a club. Back in the 80s, like a city like Minneapolis, St. Paul, where I grew up, Twin Cities, they had like 10 comedy clubs, which is fucking insane. Like yeah. now they have two. But they just, and so it dilutes the, the content. So, you, right. you know, you just have people like going on and, telling hacky just kind of stupid observational shit so it just all the clubs started folding and folding and folding and folding so when i started 96 the money was nothing i mean i would get like 150 dollars a week for a whole weekend yeah so Holy i would not the headline but right, it was right, like but yeah to mc i was living with my mom and then the opening act would get like 500 and then the headline would get like 1200 you know and to me that was like oh my god i made 1200 dollars was that Wednesday, th- Sunday, or Thursday, Friday, It was like Saturday? Tuesday, Sunday. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. So it's like, you know, everybody was dead. So the people that started in that generation, like, really believed in it. You know, I mean, all those people, I mean, we just struggled. And yeah. it's like, everybody came out of it, you know. And, you know, that, that scene brought comedy back single-handedly. Right. Like, those years and those comedians, it just was a fresh take. It wasn't... A guy with a tie, like, yeah, my wife is a fucking <laughs> cunty who no. But uh That guy was good though. <laughs> yeah. My wife. No, but it was like people that really gave a fuck. I mean, I remember living in New York with Zach Alfanakis and doing shows and we would do shows for nothing, like twenty dollars if that. Yeah. And we would you know, it was just like But well, there was a million shows to be had in New York, right? There was so yeah, there much- was a handful, but it was like that was a split thing too of comedy clubs and then the underground scene, the alternative movement, which right. came up around the time I started, where it was just like not like comedy club, like boom, 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 but it was just like taking your time, reading your notes, trying out stuff, right? You know, not just being rapid fire. So I kind of fell in a hybrid of that. Yeah, it's funny because like my introduction to comedy, like I said, like that was my. That was when I like. Knew, I mean, I knew when I was younger that I wanted to do comedy. I was so scared and nervous. Right. But like that. That influence of like when Zach did like Live of the Purple Onion in San Francisco, and like that meshed with like what was going on on Comedy Central. It was this wonderful hybrid kind of of like the alternative scene, whatever the fuck they wanted to call it back then, and the club guys. They there kind of was like a meshing of the two. It was like kind of happening at once, and then it broke apart and it became like a battleground of like them versus them. It was like this. It got like weird. I was caught in the middle of it because I was I could do both. Yeah. And yeah, it was like the kind of, it's so stupid the term, but the alternative comics would be like, oh, what do you do, the road? And I'm like, yeah, I do the road. I've got like gigs on the road. They're like, oh my God, you don't want to do this coffee house? I'm like, no, it's fucking no. I want to make money. Yeah, <laughs> like, but they, would, they, they would shit on it. And then the, the club comics would be like, oh, you go up with a piece of paper. <laughs> Which I understand, but it was like, you know, it's just dumb to, you know, it wasn't like a war, like East Coast, West Coast rap. It was, there was guns, there was guns, there was, there was a lot of bloodshed. Yeah, Janine Garofalo carried an AK. She was tough, dude. What was she her just, deal? Like, <laughs> just... Read her notes before she did it. Okay, press the trigger. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was interesting. But, you know, they were, they were both great scenes. They both still are. But now it's funny because I, like when I started in LA, I moved here in 06 and it was... And I kind of had to go to the um, alt scene or whatever it was because the club scene was fucking, A, it was dead. The comedy store was dog shit. And it was also like really cruel and mean and no one was like receptive there. Yeah. It wasn't like new guys could get around there. So like I had to just fuck my fuck around at like coffee shops and bullshit. And that became like this kind of new hotbed. And now 
years later, the clubs and the quote unquote alt scene of most people are seamless. Like most people have to do both. Right. If you kind of want to be able to bounce all these new things around, it's like you go do a show on the West side, then you go to a, a store spot, then you go. I think that's like the beauty of what's turned out. And because comedy is just at this weird bubbling point when like everybody wants to do it. I mean, even people that are like not comedians are doing it. Yeah. That's my fear is like, it's be, is it, are we diluting it again? Like, are we getting close to the, to the pop again? I don't think so because I think the quality, I mean, especially like in LA, yeah. I mean, these shows are banger shows. It's I mean, absurd. You know, there's so many great comics. It's like, I don't think it'll be diluted because they aren't opening more clubs. Right. You know what I mean? It's not like they're just expanding. They're just, the shows are just so strong. Yeah. So, you know, I don't think it's being diluted, and especially across the country. I mean, you know. The love is still there when you go to a town where they're super appreciative that you go there. We just get spoiled in Los Angeles because in one night on one show, there's five or seven headliners that their tickets alone are worth what the entire lineup is worth. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like you, the, 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 when I, when you read on Twitter, someone's like, what? Yeah. For all the, I, you know, that's like a thousand dollar ticket, Yeah. but they get it for $20 or whatever. I think we just get so inundated with it and LA people get so much of it that it's sometimes, it's just, it, it's, it's a mind fuck. Yeah. If you go back to St. Paul, it's like when it's one comic a weekend and that's it. Otherwise, yeah. the club's probably dark, right? I mean, other than local shows. Yeah, for the most part, yeah. It's headliner, opening act. What was your home club? What did you start? Acme Comedy Company in Minneapolis. That's right. That's a great fucking club. It's right? a great club. Undergr but, it's like an underground, low Yeah, ceiling. it's like what comedy should be. It's really intimate. and like. Yeah. But I remember I did a show, and people don't believe me. This is a real show. I did Parlor on Melrose when Jay yeah, Davis yeah. used to run it. Yeah. And I was like, I had some new material, so I'm like, I'm going to stop by the Parlor. So I stopped by and I'm like, hey, Jay, can you throw me on? And I'm not somebody that wears out my walk. I'm like, I'll just, you know, I'm like, I just need like 15 minutes. Right. And I'd be like, yeah, okay. And uh, so I jumped on and the crowd was pretty stoked. And then Daniel Tosh showed up and they threw him on. He did 15 minutes. Then Dane Cook showed up and they threw him on. He did 15 minutes. Then Chappelle showed up and then he did like a half hour. And the crowd's like, what the fuck is happening right now? <laughs> <laughs> like, and it was a free show. Yeah. And like, no, we didn't get paid or anything. It was just working on material. But the crowd was just like, I mean, that's like a thousand dollar ticket easily. Yeah. And it was at a sports bar on <laughs> yes, Melrose. A sports <laughs> bar. Across the street from like halfway house. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> the world. Literally across from halfway house. <laughs> the world of comedy in LA doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. The fact that that's a reality and the fact that they feed that kind of, it's like that dream of winning the lotto to Americans. You know how like every American, especially like back where we're from, it's like, I know, like, I have family members that never not play the lottery. Like, that that's it's like they have to play it every week. That's right. the fucking thing to do. That's the same idea that they put in people's heads about, um, you know, about, like, you know who might show up? You never know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, you never. So people, they're like, I have to, I want to go. That's why I think regulars go to the clubs because they're like, what if Chappelle comes and does two hours in the belly room? Which fucking ha actually happens. Yeah. Like, it does happen, which is, I guess, I think the the beauty of the scene that I think a lot of New York people I talk to are like, that's the big difference is it just doesn't happen as much over there. As it does here. Well, the comedy seller, it does. Yeah. But the comedy seller, in New York. I mean, they just, I mean, they get crazy. But that's like a, to be expected at, you know what I mean? At a comedy club, but right. here in LA. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, a sports bar, you're not going to think like why would, and why would they? Right. Yeah. But here there's something about the culture that feels like somebody hears you did it. Then Tosh is like, Oh, sports is over there. I'll probably just, I'll probably pop over there. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it feels like it kind of, like, it breeds its own success rate at places like that. And I feel like that doesn't happen as much in New York. Like, yeah, I don't think no. Gaffigan is popping over to the fucking, you know, some local corner bar. I mean, he's on the road, like, 24-7. Constantly. I've known Jim since I started. I just, certain comics, I'm like, like, I can do it, like, in scattered, like, isolated dates. Right. Or, like, I'll plan, like, a tour, you know? Mm -hmm. But then I look at, like, Sebastian, Gaffigan, uh, even Dalia. Where I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like with, on Instagram, I would just say like constant tour dates. Yeah, the which is like boom, boom, boom. I'm like, I mean, touring's fucking exhausting. I mean, that's one reason like why I kind of crashed in the summer because I just my body. You know, when you go into different time zones and altitudes, and you know, your agents like care, but they kind of don't. Like they would book me. They don't care. They'd be like, all right, you got a show in Miami, then you're in Connecticut, then you're in Aspen, and I'm like, what? And it's like back to back. Yeah. 
Where I'm like, you know, you're at that like sea level, and then all of a sudden I'm at eight thousand feet the next <laughs> night, and I'm in, you know, and you're just like you're in the Himalayas uh, the night before, and then you're going <laughs> to yeah. be scuba diving. There's an underground club. We want you to. There's a laugh factory on Everest. <laughs> they just opened it. So do you have an ice pick? Buddy, okay. will you come to Everest? Come on. It's brand new. I give you good rate. <laughs> Jamie, the owner of the club, he would pitch that, by the way. That would be something he's like, check it out, buddy. New club, brand new club inside a volcano. Do you have mitten? <laughs> forehand? Mitten forehand? Yes. I think, I think they do care about the travel, but it's hard. It's hard. And I think the thing, this is what I'm interested in too for you is like, the balance of like when you come home, do you ever feel like you're like do you do you ever feel like it's home or sometimes like home feels stagnant too because you're like I don't I've been on the road or bouncing around so much that when you're home it almost feels uncomfortable like it isn't as peaceful as you want it to be. I mean yes and no. I mean that's why I never really did local sets. I mean I am now because I'm trying to build up a new hour. Yeah. But I mean for a while it was like the clubs would like hit me up nonstop and people would be like hey do you want to do my show and I'm like no like I just got off the road. Yeah, you just, I just, you just did a bunch of I want shows. to like see a movie, right, or something. I just get wasted, but um, get wasted and then see a movie. Yeah, I think most wasted. comics don't do that though. Most get. comics don't like to take a break. Yeah, I mean, there's certain comics that I mean, they're just machines. I was just always laid back. I mean, if anybody's seen my shows, they're laid back. I mean, I bring a piece of paper still on stage and like to put it down under a bottle of water and. I think people have this weird negative connotation with that, but it, it, it's it's not... It gives a fuck. It doesn't matter. It, the jokes are still good. It's not like that's going to change the performance aspect. I think people have this kind of like vaudevillian thought that like you come out and you're this like great, amazing act and like you're putting on this... And they want to be like, oh, 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 like all that thing. And yeah. you're like, no, this is still... This is always going to be this work in progress. Like the, the, the thing that people that love comedy love is that like... They're watching you grow this thing with them. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And then if you put it on TV or wherever the fuck, that's the final product. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize, realize it's like, you know, comedy still at this. I mean, I've done it 23 fucking years. It's still trial by error. You know what I mean? Or whatever the fuck. Trial by fire. Or what is it? Either works. Trial by error or fire. I mean, we can't. Okay, vote right here. Click this for trial by fire. Dude, which? <laughs> so whatever the fuck, trial by diarrhea. But, yeah. um, you know, it's like you have to, like, work out new material. So it's like you have to do it on stage. Yeah. Like you can't, you know, com comedians don't stand in front of a mirror. So it's like, you know, when shit bombs. I mean, I, <laughs> I had some fucking semi-clunkers the other night, last weekend. And I was just like, ah, all right, all right, point taken on that one. And then you tweak it or you dump it or whatever. I mean, usually, like, if I think it's funny, I'll tell it and then have people catch up to it. Have you ever bombed on a TV set? Yeah. You I have? did. Yeah? I did. I've got... Like, a mon um, like, a, like one of those uh, Just for Laughs, like, uh, galas or whatever? No, I... Um, well, there's two stories. This wasn't a bomb, but I did The Tonight Show with Jay Leno way back in the day. <laughs> and uh, I fucking killed. It was awesome. Right. And the bookers were like, use my set as like the standard of like how you, how you do it. Right. And uh, it was really cool. And then the second time I did it, I was a little bit more confident. <laughs> and uh, I totally spaced my first joke. I mean, literally, it's like, eh, it's worth it. And I walk out and I'm like, what is my first joke? This is live on the air. And I go... <laughs> Um, Did you say out loud, what's my first joke? Yeah, and I go, <laughs> oh, my God. And I go, well, at least I'm not on The Tonight Show. <laughs> and then I go, my mom's watching, just horrified. And then it came to me, and I was like, oh, here's a joke. And the audience laughed, and then I told the joke, and I went fine. <laughs> but it was the like first couple of minutes. one of those moments where I was like, oh, were you Were you God. boozing? What? Were you boozing? No. Did you ever booze on TV performances or no? Um... Cause I don't, you don't, not really. I've been hung over for them, right? But you don't drink before you get on stage. Oh, I have. Yeah, I have. But, but for TV stuff, I mean, for TV stuff, no. The drunkest I've ever been was uh, way back again. It was a show called Late Friday. Do you remember Late Friday? I mean, I know it. I don't. Of course, I wasn't fucking. It for came it, on after Conan. Yeah, and it was just a stand-up show. You know, they would have five comics, and uh, I mean, this is. 15 years ago and yeah, and so they did this which many shows make this mistake where uh they have an open bar <laughs> so me and paul f Tompkins and um 
Marilyn Rice. I can't remember who else was on the show, but it was a really strong lineup. And we show up and they go, our call time, our show up time to get into hair and makeup was four hours before the taping. Jesus. Four hours <laughs> with an f- open bar. So we're all like, do we start? <laughs> so we all just get obliterated. Right. So I walk on stage drunk with a cocktail and fucking <laughs> do my set. It's fine. You know what I mean? But it was just like these shows that do that. And then they quickly stopped doing that because of our taping. Because of you. They might have done one more where they did it. And they were like, okay, let's not, yeah. let's not do that. But to say when I bombed, like bombed, yeah. my buddy Jordan Rubin was working for uh, Carson Daly. Yeah, he's great. I know him. Yeah, Carson's a good dude. And he was doing... Um, I was going to say Jordan. I don't fucking know Carson. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, dude. I don't know Carson Daly. He's here. Well, he's a really good guy. Okay. Shout out so to Carson. So he did his talk show, and they would have comedians. And Jordan's like, hey, will you do a set? And I'm like, no, man. Because it was on at like 2 in the morning. And I'm like, no, I'm good. And he's like, dude, it'd be really solid if like I put, you know, if I could put you on. And I'm like, I don't want to do it. And he's like, just come on. So I'm like, okay, all right, fine. I'll do him a favor. So I do the, I walk out and I'm doing my set and I tell my first joke and it fucking eats it. And I'm like, and, and I mean like eat it. And then I do another one and it fucking bombs. And I just go, <laughs> and I turn to Carson who's at his desk. I'm like, really? Really? <laughs> I turn the crowd, I'm like, really? This is and I see Jordan and like I'm this is on and I'm like, oh my God. So I just like phone in the rest of the set. The crowd was just stupid. Not that I'm a genius, but I am. No. But, but you uh, are. no, but they I was like, warm-up? they just it was just a tank job. And I was just and I got off stage and I was like, what the why the fuck did I do that? I knew it was going to be bad. Jordan was like, sorry about that. And I'm like, <laughs> God damn it. Do you have that tape? It's got to be somewhere. God, I want to find those tapes. Those are the tapes I want to find so bad. When people bomb and they're like, I don't even know where that thing is. I want to see those. Yeah, I, I remember one time I was at the Comedy Cellar in New York. And this is when the old Conan O'Brien used to tape in New York. And I was hanging out at the Comedy Cellar. And they have a restaurant above the club. And all the comedians are like, you're on Conan tomorrow? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, you should run your set. And I'm like, no, man, I got it down. It's good. And like, no, you should run it. Like Dave Attell and a bunch of people. Just fucking with you. And they're like, dude, you should, you should run it. And the host is like, you want to run it? And I'm like, no, I'm good, man. And they're like, you should, dude, if it's tomorrow, you should run your set. <laughs> so I go, fuck. All right, fine. So I go, and when you run a TV set, you've got to time it out. So it's like you can't interact with the audience. You just got to like do your jokes. So in New York and a lot of clubs, it's like the audience is weirded out if you just go up, especially in New York. So I just go on. I'm just like bah, 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 doing my jokes, tanking horribly. <laughs> and I'm like, none of this is funny. None of this is funny to the crowd. I just snap. And they were like, no. And I'm like, <laughs> one guy. So then the comedians are laughing in the back of the room. I'm like, and so I'm like, this is going to be on Conan tomorrow. This is on fucking TV. And it's not funny. Fuck you. And I just keep telling my jokes. I just keep bombing. And I'm like, fuck this. And I just storm off stage. And I go back upstairs. And people are like, how'd it go? And I'm like, I fucking hate you. I hate all of you. <laughs> and I just went. And the taping went fine. But it, it was, was just great. like. That's just them looking to bury you. They want to get in your fucking head. Well, no. They were just like having fun. It was just, you know, they didn't want to like hurt me. No, but they just wanted no, to like get in your fucking You're implying that they brain. want to hurt me. They wanted to kill you. They wanted you dead. How did you, how was your. How did you end up, what was the meeting point of you becoming close with Sandler and like getting in, becoming friends with him and like being a part of like his world? That was off that Comedy Central special. Really? The first one. Yeah. So they had, you know, like they had replayed it and he was in bed with his wife and they were just channel surfing and they stopped on my special and they watched it and he wrote my name down and he went to the office and he goes, who is this? kid and uh they were like oh that's nick swartz he's a young comic and he goes i want to meet him so he called his manager and they were like yeah we represent him so he was i was with the same management company and so my manager calls me he goes adam sandler wants to sit down with you and i go what fuck are you talking about <laughs> and he goes he wants to meet you and i go why and he goes i don't know you just apparently he saw your stand-up so I go into his office, just me, just fucking dumb kid from Minnesota, and I'm like, what's up, man? 
And he goes, hey, how you doing? And he goes, uh, I saw your special, me and my wife, and I uh, wrote your name down. He's like, really funny. And I go, oh, thanks, man. I go, I'm a huge fan. I go, part of my sensibility, I grew up on your sensibility. And he goes, ah, that's cool, that's cool. And he goes, I have a movie called Grandma's Boy. And I go, okay. And he goes, I heard you're a writer. And I go, yeah. And he goes, I saw you doing jokes about your grandma. And I go, yeah. And he goes, we have a script, PG-13 romantic comedy, but we don't want that. We want it hard R. And uh, we'd like you to do a rewrite on it. You can write yourself into the movie any part you want. Just create a part for you. So I read the script. It was, you know, not uh, great. Um, <laughs> it just wasn't my thing. It was a broad PG-13 romantic right. comedy. So I did a f full page one rewrite. And uh, me and Alan Covert, who's a star, and I sat down and created the robot guy and all the crazy shit. And, you know, the rest was history. And then Alan and Adam read it, and they loved it. And... You know, they were, you know, obviously a huge part of it. And we just collaborated on this movie and they, you know, came out the way it came out. It's Bombed at the box office horribly. As most great comedies <clears throat> do, though. Yeah, a lot of good comedies. And I knew it was going to. I'm like, no one's going to. They, they didn't know how to market it or whatever. So then after that, Sam was like, okay, well, I have this movie idea called Benchwarmers. And then I did that. And then he's like, I want you to jump on my movies. And I started working on his movies. And then we just hit it off because he's like a really down to earth, like chill dude. <laughs> Diarrhea. And uh, so am I. So it's like we just were like just sports fans and, you know, just chill yeah. fucking dudes. Grandma's Boy was the beginning, though. It was such that a was, was the was a great start movie, of man. like, yeah, with me and Adam. Are you friends with anybody on, like everybody from that film, they stayed close? Yeah, I mean, we're all still friends. Joel David Moore, who played the robot guy. He lives like right up the street. Yeah, he does. Yeah, I just had lunch with him. He's yeah. a really close friend. I still run into Jonah every once in a while. I haven't seen Linda in a, in a minute, but yeah, we're all close. Dante. That's great. It's funny because like a lot of people do those like that Hollywood thing where they're like, yeah, it's like a family. I mean, we all like fucking we love each other. But sometimes you do work with people where you're like, this is almost kismet that we all came together because we do all get along and the like everyone has good chemistry and you click right and kind of like yeah, it, it, it's nice when it happens. Like Sandler's formulated his universe that way, which is you know if anybody's doing it right, that guy fucking did it right. He's like, I'm just gonna put non-assholes in my life. Like, I'm going to work with people I want to work yeah, with. Yeah, if you have an ego, I mean, a lot of people wonder that. They're like, why does he work with the same people? And he's like, and I'm like, because he doesn't want to be around fucking douchebags. If you're, if you show any kind of characteristic like that, you know, he's just like, oh, I don't want to be around that. But and if, a lot of people aren't. I mean, people always ask me, like, who's the biggest asshole? And I'm, I mean, really, I haven't really met that many assholes. Everyone's pretty pretty cool no but it's but it is true in hollywood i like i've done enough things with different people that like i learn you're like oh dude there are a lot of egos so i get why certain people don't want to work with other people anymore because it's just like a clashing of like personalities and it would be right like imagine if anybody walked off the street and you had to pick 15 random people to work with some of those fucking people you're not going to get along with. That's just nature. You know what I mean? Right. It's just, so in film, there's it's in TV, it's the same thing in film. It's like, who knows? Like, so when you can control your universe like he does, why wouldn't you fucking pick people that you are like? I like these guys. They do the right thing and they don't fuck up. And you know what I mean? Like, did Sandler ever have a moment? Like, were you partying on set when he was and, and was like, you gotta cool it the fuck out? I mean, he he was less than thrilled with like. Because he knew I was a big drinker, and right. I mean, I would I would never really carry it over into you know what we did. I mean, you know, aside from maybe one or two hiccups, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just you know I always just told him like he just lived in a different world than I did. You right. know what I mean? So it was like as much as me and him are the same. You know, he's got a family. He's a great husband. You know, he oversees like so much, an entire company that's multi, multi, $100 million company. You know, so he's just got so much on his plate where I'm like, ah, I got like a week off. Like, I'm going to get hammered and watch sports. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like he could never understand that, you know? Yeah. So it was just, we came from two different worlds in that respect. What were the hiccups? You want to say, tell me no, what were the hiccups? No, I mean, that's between me and I. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nothing bad. But, no, you just, you, know. you slipped up and he got fucking. Yeah, I mean, he would just be like, Jesus Christ, Nick. But, you know, I always delivered, and I always, you know, when we were touring with stand-up, I would drink sometimes, and, you know, it would never, there was never a disaster, you know, right. by, by, not even close, but, you know, there would be times. Well, there was one time when uh, we were filming this movie, Just Go With It, 
Yeah. And uh, there was a ton of people in the movie. And Dan Patrick, you know, he's a yeah, Dan so Patrick yeah, show. DP. Yeah, he's the best. Big sports a caster. He's been on ESPN. Anyway, so Dan, so we had the, like, the day off. So it was like a Friday night. And uh, um, Dan's like, you want to go get a drink? And I'm like, yeah. So we're filming on Maui. And we go to um, Tommy Bahamas. was like the bar close to the hotel. Where they sell the shirts. Yeah, where they sell the shirts. So I showed up um, shirtless with uh, no shoes and board shorts. <laughs> so they're like, you can't be in the bar. So I walked to the clothing store and bought a Tommy Bahamas shirt and shoes. <laughs> so I just looked like, whatever. So Dan, I went through a phase where I was doing these shots, mind erasers. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So I was like. Explain to people what a mind eraser is. A mind eraser is in like a cocktail glass. Like, like a, a rock low ball, low glass, ball. yeah, like th- like this. Yeah, exactly, like that. And um, I can't even remember. It's like Kahlua. Um, I can't remember the ingredients. V- vodka. It's vodka, Kahlua, yeah. and like one other. There's something else. Yeah, there's one sweetener in there. There's like a some, yeah. something sweet in there. Not a triple sec, but no. It's something that whatever. So what you do is you put straw in and you fucking just suck the whole thing down. <laughs> It's a fucking and it's called absurd. a mind eraser for a reason. <laughs> yeah. So me and Dan are doing mind erasers, and we're going back and forth, and we do like four or five. And I'm like, can I get another mind eraser? And Dan's like, I'm done, dude. I'm going to get like a beer. So I do like five more mind erasers. So now I'm obliterated. Mm. <laughs> so I stumble out of the bar, and then I fucking lose my phone somehow. Cut to... <laughs> I wake up on a putting green, sprinklers, <laughs> and I'm like, so it's like six in the morning, and I'm like, what the fuck? So I'm like, where am I? Am I in Jurassic Park? Like, I'm looking around. So I'm like, holy shit. So I find a road, and I'm like, no idea where I am. Mind erased. And uh, I've, I hail a car. It's driving up, and I'm like, hey, hey, hey. I'm like, where am I? I'm like, do you know where this hotel is? And the guy's like, yeah, it's like a mile and a half that way. And I'm like, fuck. I go, can I get a ride? And the guy's like, no. And just drove away. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So I just start walking down the road. And then Adam's assistant pulls up. And I'm like, fuck. So he goes, hey, man, what are you doing? Why are you up so early? And I go, I'm just going for a run, man. I'm just getting some air. I'm working out. Just, you know. And he's like, oh, that's awesome. He goes, you work out in... Why do you work on Tommy Bahama stuff? And I was like, you know, it's Hawaii. <laughs> you know, like why not? You know, just keep it keep it festive. Yeah. And he's like, all right, do you want to ride back? And I'm like, then I had to go with it. I'm like, no, nah, man, I'm not done with my walk. And he's like, oh, that's really cool, man. Drove away. <laughs> and I had to like suck up a mile and a half walk. <laughs> but uh, did you ever admit to them that you were fucking out? I didn't, because I mean, I, you know, it didn't affect anything. But then Patrick throws me under the bus on his show. He's interviewing Sandler, and he got the story wrong. So they were talking about drinking, because Dan can drink a lot. He's a good drinker. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I remember Swarty. And just go with it. He was drinking. And Adam's like, yeah. And uh, he goes, yeah, I remember uh, one time he uh, passed out in a sand trap, and he showed up on set, and he had sand in his hair. And Adam was like, yeah. And I'm listening. I'm like, what the fuck? (laughs) I didn't do that. And I texted Dan. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? I didn't do that. And he goes, it was something like that, though. And I'm like, yeah, but it wasn't. I didn't show up on. Like, I wouldn't be that unprofessional. It's telephone I mean? for sure. You're like, yeah, dude. Then he, then he like pissed <laughs> yeah. on that guy. It was nuts, man. Set was crazy that day. Yeah. Like, Dan, but, don't fucking don't, don't embellish my story. Yeah, I was like, Jesus. But that's what happens when you drink that they got out of control. And sometimes people tell a story that you. Sometimes people tell me a story that I'm like, is that fucking not what happened? Because after enough times. I would forget sometimes. I'm like, right. I don't think that's what happened, but I guess they're like, no, dude, you did. It was awesome. Like a buddy of ours got left in Mexico and the story has grown like a bunch of different ways. Like he literally fell asleep in the back of a fucking 15 pass van. And when we all got dropped off at this resort, he was passed out and we legitimately forgot about him. And he got brought to the guy's house that owned the van <laughs> and woke up at the guy's house and was like, huh, huh, huh? but like the variations have been like, yeah, dude. And then he like walked into the house and I heard he, he like laid down in a bed in the house and, and the guy tried to fight him and he fought him. Like, it's just, it just gets inflated until someone's like, that's not what happened, dude. He walked yeah. home sad through the fucking desert. But the, but that, I mean, that's, that's part of the game of like, when you get fucked up, those stories are going to get pushed around. But luckily, you didn't do... I've never heard one bad story about you. I've never heard one where you're like, 
Swartzen really fucked up. It's bad. He did he did the thing. You know what I mean? Like he Yeah, he's no, I was always super chill. I mean, I would just you know, I mean, there's so many scenarios where I would find myself in those kind of situations where I'm like, where am I? <laughs> like, what the fuck? I mean, I remember back in the day when I was first coming up, after my first special air, and I would do colleges, and I would, like, join frats. Like, I would, like, you know, they'd be like, hey, we're having a party, and we would all just go and rage. And they'd be like, do you want to, like, join our frat? I'm like, yeah. And I would do, like, part of their initiations, and it was just like... <laughs> I just, you know, it was a blast, but I remember uh, there was one where I had to, like, chug, like, a bottle of Crown Royal for, like, 20 seconds, which is, like, fucking long. 20 seconds? That's the whole bottle? That's, like, the bottle? It was, like, yeah, it was a long fucking time. That's insane. It was one of the worst hangovers. Yeah, I barfed over the airport. How, you, barfed, uh, you barfed often? Was that your... Did you puke all the time? I didn't. I would always puke the morning after. I was See, never, I like, a, you know, I wish I was, like, puke at the end of the night to at least get that shit out of you. See, I never puked. Even when I drank way too much, I don't puke, which sucks. I wish I did. Yeah. But I just can't do it. Some people, it's like, that's it's what they do, gift. and then they clean up. I just hold it. It just doesn't come out, man. Yeah. It's bad. I hate it, because I, I think everyone I know that pukes, they feel like they, they, they're they good again. But if I puke, I yeah, feel I like people it's like worse. That. I'm way worse if I throw If I throw up, it's, it's like a two-day, I'm fucked. Yeah. I mean, that's why I would go on these things where it was like, I wouldn't let the hangover hit me. So I would wake up like still buzzed. Right. And I would just run it back. Keep drinking. Yeah. Fuck. So it was like, you know, and people would be like, holy shit. And I was friends with it, you know, still am, but like a lot of drinkers where we would kind of, you know, like Dave Attell and guy, you know, he quit. But like Doug Stanhope's a huge drinker. Still, he still yeah. yeah. And like I would always touch base with him. Artie Lang and like guys were. You know, it, it was like we were like like drinkers, you know? Yeah. I mean... And a lot of those guys are getting clean. I think the new generation of guys is like so many people are getting sober now. I was saying that before. A lot of people are. So many people are getting sober. It's really it's really hurting the brand of the show, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> but so many people I that mean, I have that I'm friends with, you know, or the, or they got sober and I'm... It's just... It's been how I know them now forever. You know, like Bobby Lee was... Bobby's him. been sober He's for He's been a sober while, for a long yeah. time. But like guys like that, that like that's all they did years ago was party so fucking hard and then they had to stop. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It just was a, it was a forced, you know, forced thing. It wasn't a choice. Yeah. Once you get that fucking memo, which I did when I was in the hospital, it was just like, all right, here's the deal. Yeah. Like your body's just like, you want to keep doing this? Like it's, you know, and I just, I realized at that point, because the doctor was like, you know, if you want, you can drink. Because I have friends that have and went through a similar type of thing, and they went back to drinking. Fuck. And the doctor was like, you can, but it's gonna come back worse, and you could die like that. Fuck that. And I was just like, okay, I'm not fucking doing that. You yeah. know what I mean? And especially, it's like, especially because you're so young, like you don't want to. I mean, you know, I feel like if it's if this happened at 75, I'd be like, fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> no, for sure. Doesn't matter. But at 43, and it's you know, it's just. It's not worth it. It's too young. I mean, my, my uh, a good family, a family friend, uh, without saying anything, but she passed away at 40 years old from cirrhosis. Cirrhosis? Yeah. Am I saying it right? Yeah, and the doctors, when she went in, was like, you've got like two or three months to go. This thing is like really, it's shutting down by on a daily basis. Right. And they were like, this is like, this is of an alcoholic who's been drinking for like 40 plus years. He's right. like, the comparison in photography was like, this looks like a thing that we've seen for someone who drank for so long, for so many, and like twice your age. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's just like, it, and it does, it, it, ga it even gives like on a peripheral, it gives me like a weird, like, I should be a little bit healthier and slow down drinking. Not like I think I'm there, but like you just sometimes, those things make you go, fuck man, even friends. Like, have you felt other friends change their habits or attitudes? A lot of people got freaked out. Nobody knew what was happening because I didn't have a phone. Right. So nobody knew. I was just, all of a sudden, I was just off social media. Yeah. So my fans were like, um, and then my friends, so I was, my birthday was in the hospital. So all these people were texting me and like on social media and, and on my phone. Happy birthday, love you, and all this stuff. But I never got it or responded. So then everybody was like, people just started to panic. And then when they found out and I came home and I told them, everybody, like a lot of my friends were like, oh, shit. If that happened to Nick, even though I was worse than everybody. But, uh, you know, a lot of my friends still were heavy, heavy drinkers. Yeah. A lot of them kind of like panicked a little bit and cut back or quit. 
I mean, that, that I feel like that's been happening. I, I see it happening more and more in the comedy community. And like last night, Dom Herrera said this. He was just like, you know, he had a health scare, a health incident happen to him. And he was like, it's just fucked up that we have open bar. Like our whole career is open bar. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, that is a weird thought to think. Like no other job is like open bar. I'm totally cool to do this every night. <laughs> yeah, like whenever the like, fuck you want. <laughs> no, you get caught up and it. it's just so easy. And I, I mean, again, it's so fun. I mean, I just... I had a blast. I mean, I just... Do you feel healthier now? Do you feel like... Oh, yeah, for sure. And and no, I wake up at like 7 a.m. I have like a whole routine with like juices and vitamins and all, like all this stuff. And I mean, I love it, you know? Do I you mean, have to be on medication now for the rest of your life? Yeah, I'm on a fucking like 40 different pills. No. No, I don't <laughs> take any meds or anything. Nothing? No. To recover your insides is all... It's like all just going to... It's all vitamins. Healing. Wow. It's all self I mean, that's the great thing about the human body is it does regenerate. It's I mean, the liver does and... My pancreas is now back to normal and it's, you know, but it's, you've got to like eat healthy and you've got to monitor your vitamins. I mean, you know, I got blood work done and I've got a great doctor and, you know, he walked me just through all this stuff to, to take, which I already, I mean, I took it anyway, but just a couple other things to, I mean, like I take acupuncture, which is amazing. Yeah. That shit's good. Yeah. It's really great. I love the way I feel. The first time it freaked me out a little bit. Like I felt it's so weird. uniquely different that I was like, Ooh, this is like scary how much this did with so little, like acupuncture isn't from a, a tangible standpoint you don't feel like it's doing that much and then you're done and you're like holy fuck i feel it, it really does if wild. you go to somebody that really knows what they're doing right it's like anything like a masseuse or anything where the, if you go to someone that's really in tune like my, my dude is like the shit he studied with like monks and like all this stuff like overseas and all this crazy shit but uh yeah i mean it's it's crazy yeah it like he'll put mental. a needle in my like in between my toe and I'm like, ah, I'm like, what is that? And he goes, that's a pressure point for your kidneys. I'm like, that bad? <laughs> but it was like all this stuff. And then he would put my liver and like, and you could feel your body pull the pin in or the needle. Yeah. And I'd be like, ah, what the fuck? And he's like, your body's grabbing it because it needs to release pressure because it's under so much stress. And I'd be like, fuck. It's really? crazy. And he's like, yeah. It is and magic. It's pure fucking. It's magic. it's incredible. It. It's, it's, man. it's like it's like it is voodoo shit. Where you're like, I I do see how like like some people don't can't don't want to do it, don't get into it because they're like, I don't know, what is it gonna do? But the same way, like my dad's never had a massage. That's how like Midwest. My father's like, I'm not letting someone put their hands all over my right. body. Right. It's like that old school like, nah, not that's, on my watch. That's goofball shit. I ain't doing that. It's yeah. like it does really. I like I highly suggest it. And and especially now that you're like. Now that you're trying to like kind of get back to square one, do you feel like your writing and your comedy is getting more like centered and stronger? You're not like floating a little bit, and like because I feel like when you're partying, you're drinking. Any of us, I'm not writing as much. Like I'm just not producing as much. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm definitely more focused now on doing sets. I have a set tonight. I did set last night at the weekend. I mean, I'm like back in the grind of yeah, you know, writing and stuff. And you're building an hour. Yeah, but Are I mean, you, you know, like that's what I liked about having that dichotomy of like working as a stand up and writing. And then I like, I wanted a month or two off where it was like, I want to watch sports. I don't want to like deal with Hollywood bullshit. It's like, I've been in the grind for so long. And it's like, I mean, that to me is like where problems happen with like executives and networks and like pitching ideas. And they're like, I don't get it. And people are always like, how come you don't do more movies and more TV stuff? And it's like, it's so fucking hard. So I pitch hard. a show every year yeah. and I post it online. Like, so many shows I've created where people are like, I don't get it. And you're just at the mercy of, you know what I mean? These, yeah. this shit. So, you know, after a while you're like, fuck this. I'm going to drink for a month and watch baseball, you know? And you need the relief. You yeah. It's like you want to have a life. Like, well, I don't want to be just, I mean, that's why I love stand up comedy. It's like, what I say goes. Like, no one, there's no executive going, like, I don't get that, you know? Like, how many people said, I don't get gay robot when you oh, did that? We created gay robot. It was an awesome pilot, and you can find it on YouTube. It's so fucking funny, dude. It was so ahead of its time, and they tested it, and they, you know, they have a, a thing where they test pilots. So you, they shoot a pilot, and they have a room of people that will watch it, like forty people, and they'll be like, they'll have a buzzer of things that make them laugh and then things they don't like, and so they tested it in a room full of forty young men, yeah. like in their twenties, which was my demographic when the show was created. And they were all like, oh, this show's too gay. So they were all like insecure too and couldn't gay. just laugh. So they're all in a room with each other. And nobody wanted to be like, yeah, it's funny. And then they'd be like, what do you fuck, queer? 
<laughs> some stupid shit. So the show just got killed. Right. <laughs> they just were like, oh, now we can't do it. I'm like, you can't just stand this show on its own and stand by it. It's funny. And it wasn't anti-gay like at all. It was just like it was fun just and fun. silly. It was so fun. It was just like, a, you know, this likable character and, you know, so it's just, it's frustrating as fuck. So people that are listening, you know, so many people, me included, just, you know, you create as much as you can and you're just at the mercy of people like, yeah, I don't know. Like, did you create Terry or did they come up with that for Reno? I created Terry. Right. So you've created most of your... I, I create almost... 100% of what I do. Which I'm is not a big fan rare. of doing stuff. I mean, I do other people's shit, like Blades of Glory, and this movie 30 Minutes or Less, which is awesome. You know, I'll do other people's stuff if it's like I trust the directors and the people involved. Right. That was Ruben, the, Ruben's movie, right? Yeah. I love Ruben it. Fletcher did 30 Minutes or Less. Me, Danny McBride, Jesse Eisenberg, Aziz. It was great. That was really fun, man. It's so underrated. But, uh, you know, it's just, you, you know, you try as best as you can to create stuff, and then people... It's such a broken record. I mean, that's why I was going to retire. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I just might quit. From the health scare? You were like, I'm going to just... No, no, no. Out. Just in general. I mean, I was like kind of over a lot of shit before. Like the, at the beginning of the summer, I was kind of like, I'm going to take the summer off. And like, I just want to like watch sports and just hang out with my friends. When you say retire, like, do you mean only do stand up and fuck the other stuff? I was going to like, I t toyed with the idea of like, just, I don't know, moving to Hawaii and like writing a book or just something different. Yeah. Is that but, what you think you'd do if you stopped? I mean, I will like later on in life. Like right now, I've got another TV show idea, which I might just shoot on my own. You should. That's what I think I'm going to do. I talked to my director from Grandma's Boy, and I was like, let's just fucking shoot this thing and Who then show it to people. And then they'll be like, oh, okay. Right. Who shot Grandma's Boy? Uh, this guy, Nick Goosen. Oh, that's right. You're, yeah. that's, you're an old friend of yours, right? Yeah, he's, yeah I just got the right. phone with him. I was on my way here. Yeah. Yeah, no, that I think that's the move though. Now is to just give them the product. And it's be like, just Look, we're so doing much it. better, and at least worst case scenario, you film either a pilot or just like a teaser, yeah, or something. Worst case scenario, you just throw it on YouTube, and it lives on YouTube, and it'll be great for uh, my buddy Maddie Mathis just did that. Who's a Canadian? I chef. know Matt. Yeah, he fucking just put his show up because he was like, "Fuck this." Vice wanted to do their thing with him again, and he was like, "No disrespect, but like, I just want to do it my way." Yeah, and that's why he just put his show just a dash up because he was like. I just am going to shoot this myself then because different people had different opinions about it. And he was like, I, 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 okay, never mind." So they just funded it, shot it, put it up. And now it's f like doing super well online. He was like, I'm just going to do that. Yeah. Cause that's my audience anyway. He's like, what am I fishing for a network to brand it with their shit that I don't maybe like, or doesn't represent me anyway. But I think that's the hardest thing is like, where does it go? And it's like, you might as well just make shit on your own. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just super frustrating. I've seen it happen with, you know, a million people. But, like, working with Sandler, I would see executives like, I don't get that. I don't get this scene. And everybody likes it. Yeah, and I'd be like, it's pretty fucking funny. And Sandler would be like, no, 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 no. This is funny. No, it goes, like, blah, blah, blah. And he would explain it, and they're like, yeah, but... And he'd be like, what the fuck? <laughs> he would get so mad. It's like... Whether or not you like Adam Sandler or not, he's still Adam Sandler. You know he's what I mean? Phenomenal. Like he has a viewpoint, he has a sense of humor, he has a style. Again, whether you like it or not, he still knows what he's doing. Yes. You yeah. know, and he's I mean, I think he's fucking hilarious. He's and a, it's like he's a genius. You just somebody like him, it's just like you just step away and let him do his thing. It's like, you know, South Park, like guys like that, like when Chappelle did his show. It's like take somebody's creative vision and just let them do it. Yeah. And just like you don't have to a lot of executives and stuff feel like they have to give a note or they have to be like well what if we change this and they just do it just so they feel like they're a part of it right but it's not really helping the project no no you know not. what i mean well i hope the next fucking tv show that you're pitching i hope it's independently you know received by someone that doesn't fucking step on your toes and get in your way and shit yeah i mean uh, you know we're just figuring that out now i mean right now i'm just focusing on stand up and nailing are you touring i I have two shows at the end of December in Minnesota, and then I'm doing scattered dates in the spring, and then I'm doing a monster tour in the fall. Of 2020? So, yeah. So okay. I was supposed to do a big tour in the spring, but it's like not, it's just not ready. My agent's like, no, let's go. And I'm like, I don't have a name. I have no artwork. I don't have a new hour. I've got maybe 30 minutes, you know, maybe 35. Right. So it's, I want, I want it to be strong. What? At least you're honest. Yeah. I mean, okay. I just don't. I don't want to do that to my fans of where, you know, I, I want to do a fresh hour. Right. And it was tricky because I had a new hour 
And then Netflix was like, we'll give you a half hour. So I'd already toured with an hour. So now I have a half hour, but now I have a half hour of stuff I've already toured with. Oh, right. So it's like kind of tricky. So if you see me on tour, I might have some stuff that you might have seen before, but it's a part of the new hour, if that makes sense. It's happening. Yeah. So, so don't, that, like, don't be too upset. Acme in December? No, I'm doing Treasure Island Casino. Treasure Island Casino in December. Two shows, 27, 28. It's and then be a insane. spring tour and then a massive fall tour of 2020. Yeah. Good, man. And this summer, I'm just going to fucking... S- oh. What are you going to do, dude? Hi. I'm going to steal a helicopter. <laughs> I remember this is a true story. This is yeah. such a booze story. Me and my friends are partying in San Diego. And uh, it was the last night. Uh, I was threw out the first pitch at a Padres game. So me and all my friends went down, hammered. And my buddy goes, um, dude, let's go to Tijuana. Tijuana, Mexico is right over the border. And I go, all right. How are we getting there? And he goes, I don't know. And I go, should we get a helicopter? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I know a dude. And I go, okay. So he calls this guy. There's like four of us. Calls this guy. And I puts me on the phone. I'm like, oh, what's up? Yeah, I want a helicopter. Do you want him? And he goes like, all right, it's going to be like 12 grand. I'm like, all right. And I get the phone back. And then one of my friends, thank God, just goes, Hey, what are we doing? <laughs> I don't think we should do this. And I was like, what? And he's like, I really don't. Th- this is a fucking horrible idea. And then I like kind of had that moment of lucidity, you know, where I was like, oh, yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> I took the phone back. I'm like, we'll call you back. We'll call you back. I don't think. I've ever... And I just hung up the phone. <laughs> it's just like, what? It took one guy to go, we're not, that's a, yeah, no, I don't want to die God. on the way to Tijuana. Nick Schwartz and dies with friends in a <laughs> helicopter like, at the border. I mean, jeez, my that. friend Jimmy, thank God. Well, I'm also glad you're not dead in real life because you're a treasure and I'm, I love you and I'm happy thank that you're you. alive and healthy. Yeah, thanks, man. I love you too. And uh, Thank you for coming and doing this. Of course, dude. And telling your truth, dude, your hospital truth. God. It's very nice. Yeah, so just if you're out there, be careful. Please if be careful. If you're out there, you should be out there. You should be out there and be careful. Um, I'm going to turn off the camera. Do you want to say one thing to the camera, uh, one last phrase? Go ahead and do it. I came up with this on my own. God bless us all, everyone. In here, we pour whiskey, 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 whiskey. Creature in the ginger beard. Sturdy and ginger. Like vampires, the ginger gene is a curse. Gingers are beautiful. You owe me $5 for the whiskey and $75 for the horse. Gingers are hell no. This whiskey is excellent. Ginger. I like gingers.